So I appreciate there would be a lot of variation in the medical uh, exposure and the knowledge among the audience. So please excuse, excuse me if I'm too basic or too over the top. You're welcome to question me at any time during the talk. I'd also like to thank the organizers for the, in, for the invitation. So what I'll do, I'll give you a flavor of a modern histopathology lab and at the end, touch about computational pathology and digital pathology. Although my colleague, Dr. Paramita, who's going to come in tomorrow, will be more uh, uh, elaborate on the computational pathology. I will just introduce computational pathology after giving a uh, flavor about how the modern histopathology lab will work. So what is histopathology? Histopathology is a study of tissue for diagnosis of disease. So what it does is that for uh, during a routine clinical uh, visit to your doctor, the doctor can take parts of tissue from your body for biopsy or in an operation, they can take a segment of bowel or uh, uh, other parts of the body and then they send it to us uh, for diagnosis of the disease. Now we study them by looking at sections under the microscope and sometimes that gives us the diagnosis, but sometimes it may not give us the diagnosis. So we have to do some additional tests. So we have to do some additional tests to fine tune the diagnosis. The, the fine tuning of the diagnosis is by either special stains or by immunohistochemistry. Now, in this era of personalized medicine, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as you mentioned, it is important to be very precise in your diagnosis. And pathologists are very absolutely central in this era of personalized medicine. It is at the desk of the pathologist, the first clinical decisions uh, regarding the patient is made, and that will continue to be the case in the future. And understanding of the workflow science is critical for the practicing pathologist and the computational expert uh, because it enables him or her to become an agent of change, positive change at an uh, institutional level. Hematology and biochemistry will offer much more automation than histopathology, which is much more labor intensive. Uh, as, you can, as you will see, a good software compa combined with a dedicated and multi-skilled motivated personnel with uh, machinery will form the backbone of a flow workflow in histopath. Now, before I go into the workflow of a modern histopath lab, it is important to understand what the workflow of a hospital. The hospital system workflow is different from a histopathology workflow. So a patient comes to the lab and there, there is an acquisition of the patient's data on the registration followed by OPD and emergency assessment followed by investigations. So this is where we come in. The investigations lead us to pathology and radiology and there we uh, make the diagnosis and the treatment or the operation happens and then there's an inpatient assessment, there's a discharge suit and then the details of regular follow-up. So this is completely different from a workflow of a laboratory information system or a histopathology lab. It starts with collection of samples followed by sample accessioning and sample identification, sampling of tissue or gross examination. I will come each of one of the each one of them one by one. Processing of tissue, preparation of slides, slide interpretation, additional special stains on immunohistochemistry, report with the diagnosis, distribution of report to the concerned person, and then discarding of the tissue. A laboratory information system or the workflow captures all this. So the so where um, uh, the samples come in in the in the initial as soon as the biopsy is done, and it, then it uh, goes away after three months. Collection of samples. Histopathological examination of a tissue starts with surgery or biopsy. The tissue is removed from the body and then placed in a fixative, which is normally formalin, which is a 10% neutral buffered formaldehyde in water, and this stabilizes the tissue to prevent decay. The purpose of fixation is to fix the tissues in a lifelike state as possible. Fixation should be carried out as soon as possible after the removal of the tissues. This is um, 
this, uh, the formalin, which is 10% neutral buffered formaldehyde in water, penetrates the tissue well, but is relatively slow. So for bigger specimens, we need to slice them to enable us to uh, the, the enable the formalin to penetrate the tissues. So this comes, the, then we come to specimen accessioning. Now the Tata Medical Center is a completely paperless digital system. So here we get everything online, but in some other hospitals we will not get everything online. So the samples are received in formalin. This is our This is, this is suppose in a hospital which doesn't have a digital system, you get the specimen pot with the specimen along with the requisition form in which the clinical details are uh, given. This is our Tata Medical Center where each specimen is marked with name, age, gender, and uh, we can see the request uh, from, the, uh, from the computer. The specimens are numbered and then we go into the gross examination of a tissue. So, <coughs> so if it is a, a small tissue like this one, so we put them into cassettes, which are these cassettes with holes, so that the, that enables the formalin and the other reagents to penetrate. This is our cassette printer which prints the cassettes according to the numbers they have been initially given because once they are out of this container, it is important to retain that identification because otherwise we will lose the identity of the uh, particular specimen. Now, gross examination of a small tissue in which we are trying to embedding the, trying to uh, put the entire tissue through doesn't need much of an effort. But for larger specimens such as big pieces of um, bowel or any tumor of the head and neck, we need to describe the specimen, measure the tumor, and submitting parts of it with relevant blockies so that they help us not only in diagnosis but also in grading and staging of the tumor. The cassettes are then uh, submitted for processing and ultimately embedded in a paraffin block. So this is a, this is a breast uh, case in which the entire breast tissue has been removed and, uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, this is also a breast tumor in which only part of the breast is removed. So what we do is that we have to color the uh, margins in separate colors so that we can identify them as margins while we seeing the tissue under, this, um, uh, under the microscope. Because not only we have to give them the, the grading of the tumor, the tumor, we also have to uh, let them know which, uh, the, how much the tumor is uh, from a particular margin. And as you can see, this, uh, this is the tumor uh, which is popping out. The, this, the black color indicates the posterior resection margin or which is in the proximity to the chest wall. And this is how uh, we uh, like to sort of try to figure out how far the tumor is from the posterior resection margin. This is an example of a bowel or a rectum which has been removed during an operation for a preoperative diagnosis of adenocarcinoma, which is the cancer of the rectum. Now, in rectal adenocarcinomas, now what happens is you give a radiotherapy to downstage the disease. Downstage means suppose it was stage three, you give radiotherapy to give it uh, to, so that it becomes stage T2 or T1 and it enables a better surgical manual, uh, uh, manipulation also. So here what happens is the, the radiotherapy has wiped out most of the tumor as we cannot see a tumor here. This is just, just edematous uh, colonic mucosa. So in a case like this we have to embed the entire tissue from here to here and to find out any microscopic evidence of tumor. So this is where the pathologist's work actually starts, starting with grossing of the tumor. So once we um, gross the tumor, they are put into cassettes, as I showed before. Uh, the cassettes uh, go into this uh, different steps of tissue processing, um, starting with dehydration, clearing, 
uh, and then impregnation, embedding, cutting, and staining. And this is one of our uh, deep and down tissue processor. Uh, so what happens is, in this one, there is a rack containing the cassettes, and they go in uh, at the different containers with this um, uh, different containers at a pre-designated time scale and go from one to another. This one moves from one to another. This is only feasible for 150 to 200 cassettes in a particular day. But in a center like Tata Medical Center, we have around 350 to 400 cassettes per day. So this is suboptimal. So, so uh, we have another um, um, the another bigger processor which can handle much bigger load. So the tech, um, so once the tissue has been fixed, it becomes hard in which can be made into thin microscopic section. This is usually done with paraffin. The technique of getting fixed tissue into paraffin is called the tissue processing. And this is what a larger tissue processor would look like. This is a modern enclosed tissue processor. We have three of them. And uh, here, uh, these are almost aut always automated for larger volumes of tissue. And this consists of an instrument that moves the tissues around through various reagents at a pre-designated time scale. And this is mostly done automated, but um, uh, in smaller centers, it, this has to be done manually as well. Wet fixed tissues and aqueous solutions cannot be directly infiltrated with paraffin. Therefore, the water from the tissues must be removed by dehydration. This is usually done with a series of alcohols at different percentages, which is starting from 70% to 95% to 100%. Then comes clearing. It consists of removal of the dehydrant, that is alcohol, with a substance that will be miscible with the embedding medium or the paraffin. The commonest clearing agent is called the xylene tissue embedding. Now the cassettes with the pre-designated tissues have gone through the tissue processors and have come out of the tissue processors. Now the leaves are being opened as you can see here. So here is a tissue whose only identification is the number that is written here. So we have to maintain, that's why the cassette printer is a very important. Suppose 9 becomes 6 or one of the zeros go, um, sort of get wiped out while getting, uh, while getting the tissue processing, we'll have a big problem in our hands. That's why it's important to have the number and to have the total log sheet of how many cassettes have gone into each particular system. Now, once they come out of the tissue processor, the technician actually opens the lid of the cassette and they have to be embedded in a particular way orientated so that we see the entire tissue. So this brown thing is the skin, and this is where the tumor lies. So if the skin is not properly aligned, what happens is we will lose the relationship of the tumor to the skin. Because some tumors, if it infiltrate the skin, it becomes stage T4, suppose mandible, head and neck tumors, breast tumors. Therefore, it is important we know the relationship of the tumor to the skin. Uh, and that's why it is, um, this step is normally done by the technician and it is very important. So here the technician uh, does pose molten, um, pose molten paraffin over and embeds it in a, in a particular way so that we can see the skin on the top and the tumor below it. Now that the molten paraffin is, is, is getting solidified um, by pick, uh, putting it on the uh, cold uh, ice uh, tray. Now what it comes, uh, then we have blocks like this. Now these blocks then needs to be cut into different sections so that we can see them under the microscope. Huh. So the, the way of cutting the blocks into thin sections are, which are only three to five micrometers, is done by microtome. The microtome is uh, nothing more than a knife with a mechanism of advancing a paraffin block standard di distances across. So we have two types of uh, um, uh, this uh, microtomes in our lab. This one is an automated one. Uh, if you look at this side, there is no, there's no hand which sort of operates. This is all the, the hand is on this side. It has, 
the machine has been designed so that it advances this part uh, three to five micrometers every time the wheel rolls in. This one was a video. It's it, it, it's is there. Let me go to the next. Should I go to the next one? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry for the technical glitch. The videos are not working. What I intended to show was that how a section would have been cut. Huh. So I'll just describe. This is a this is a microtome, and the block is been uh, the paraffin block containing the tissue would uh, is attached here. The knife is here. So every time the computer uh, the the technician rolls the hand the. Uh, Paraffin block advances three to five micrometer uh, towards the knife and cuts a thin section. So once the sections are cut, they are floated in the warm water bath, which is adjacent to it, and it is here. Um, and these warm water baths are then taken up by the glass slide, which is this one. Uh, which has been coated with egg al albumin or glycerin, and the sections are mounted on the slides. These sections are three to five micrometers. They contain the tissue, and uh, they, th it has to be without wrinkles because otherwise we would not be able to interpret them. Now, the glass slides are then placed in a warm oven for about 15 minutes to help the section adhere to the slide. Then the staining of the slides occur. Now, the staining of the uh, slides is normally done with this hematoxylin eosin stain. Hematoxylin is used to uh, illustrate the nuclear details of the cell. So, suppose this is a cell, the central part is the nucleus, and it, the way uh, we identify a cell is by identifying the nuclear details. Whether it is a lymphoid cell, whether it is an epithelial malignancy, or whether it is benign or malignant is all dependent on by looking at the nuclear details. So this cell has got uh, enlarged nuclei, but has also got abundant cytoplasm, which uh, is pink, and this is stained by the eosin stain. And th there are different sh shades of the pink, which enables us to uh, differentiate between the different uh, tumor entities that we get. Uh, sorry, this was also a video. Uh, I, I, do, I don't think this will it work. Probably not, but it's not. It's not a problem. So what happens is this is our automated stainer for a big lab like ours. It is difficult to stain manually each slide, which is around 400 slides per day. So. This is, an, uh, this is an automated stainer which contains the different uh, reagents of staining and there is a robotic arm containing the rack here. You can barely see the, uh, uh, the robotic arm with the rack of uh, these slides and they go from one uh, container with the agent at a particular concentration to, an, uh, to this end of this and that's how it, the, it gets the stain. Now, this is, uh, this is the same robotic container. Now, uh, this has, from here, it has come to this end now. Now, this is the, the, the robotic arm containing the sections that I, uh, that, I saw, that I showed you in the last picture. These were all videos, but somehow it's not working. Then we have this cover staining, a section which is stained is exposed to the environment which is liable to damage not only from handling but from but for also uh, exposure to light air dust etc therefore we need to sort of protect them from here and this is generally done by cover slipping so what is cover slipping is that we pour another small um, 
thin, uh, thin uh, cover over the, um, over the section so that we are able to uh, um, have a good protected from the damages. So this is done by an automated cover stripping machine here, which are, we are unable to show you here. So after all this, multiple steps comes the actual slide in which the pathologist start. So the pathologist had a role in the grossing and after all these steps, the slides come to the uh, con uh, consultant or the fellows for reporting. So, and our software tracks individual cases from the point of reception to the point of authorization. So this is an area, this is a skin tumor uh, which uh, shows, uh, as I showed you, this is the black color ink here uh, has been, uh, is there to indicate the deep resection margin. This is a skin tumor and we not only have to say that what type of tumor it is, we also have to measure the depth of invasion if it is a malignant tumor and then we have to give the margins from here to here and here to here and uh, from here to here. So, so that like for melanomas, you have to have so much of uh, resection, so sort of one centimeter wide margin of excision needs to be there. So this is our software, uh, which um, giving us the list of all the cases that we do. So each case is been, uh, has a uh, starts with having a case number, specimen number, lab. This is our MR or the medical records number with the patient name and the type of tests and the name of the consultant and the fellows who are there. Now these straight away uh, says you the status that the slides have been delivered to me, but have not been authorized. And there are these two these things in bold indicates that we are approaching the turnaround time of these cases, so we'll quickly have to release the cases. Okay. Um, and the the pink one indicates that the results have been entered into the system, but it has not been authorized. So this is a quick way of tracking each and individual cases because sometimes a call comes from the clinician that we want the result of this case. So rather than actually trying to find out the slide, we can actually look at the uh, software system and can straight away figure that this is the case at this level. So when the slides come to us, this is my walk station at the Tata Medical Center. We have this microscope, which is a double header in which for teaching we have fellows and there is the computer uh, system where we're here. So the pathologist, uh, as, uh, which is me, will access the software and try to get all the information that has been already stored in the system. Um, so they would want to have some particular tests or what's the history. And I, for a big case like a part of colon which is removed or a head and neck specimen, we might have 30, 40 slides. So I'll have to see each and every slide and start manually constructing the report, which can either be done by typing, transcription, handwriting, or uh, speech recognition. I do a mixture of both typing and we have a dictation software where I tell the computer, the computer starts typing the report. We use sometimes call what is called a can text where we have a, a formatted uh, report uh, and we just have to fill in the blanks and can authorize the report. But this is only for the routine specimens. Any deviation from the normal, they are not, uh, they can't do. Synoptic reporting is where there is, it's like a form, you have to fill up a form, but sometimes the clinicians find it difficult to decipher the information from them that they needed for their clinical treatment purposes. And once I authorize the report by pressing the authorize button in my computer, uh, there is a, a seamless transfer of that authorized report from the hospital software to the, uh, from the laboratory software to the hospital software. And we don't have a, we don't have to carry reports to the other departments or the OPDs uh, for them. They can look up at the computer and I can have a look. So this is a prototype uh, report of a mastectomy specimen where the uh, entire breast was removed. So as you can see, we not only have to remove, uh, not only have to report what is the tumor, which is invasive lobular car carcinoma here. We have to give the grading, the measurement of the tumor, lymphovascular invasion, the skin, 
and, and then any other DCIs, any other pathology, how many lymph nodes are involved, whether the tumor is extending beyond these uh, lymph node boundaries, and then we have to stage the disease, and then we have to do by immunohistochemistry some prognostic markers, which are ER, PR, HER2 mu, and PI67, which is an essential part of an oncologist's armamentarium these days. Now, this sort of completes the HME section, which is normally done in a routine lab as well as in our labs. Then we come to frozen section. Since uh, Tata Medical Center is an oncology center, so we routinely get frozen sections. Now, what is a frozen section? It's the surgeon is operating in the um, theater, and they send the part of the tissue to not only find out the diagnosis. Uh, this is normally they would go prepare to an operation that they know the diagnosis. But sometimes it is not. Uh, they see something unexpected, and they want to know the diagnosis of the unexpected pathology. Sometimes uh, they want to know whether the margins of the section they have taken for the tumor is clear or not. So these are the mainly common indications where we get frozen sections. It sometimes it is also helpful, even if we can't make a diagnosis, we just ask for additional tissue. That I am suspicious that this resection margin is involved by the tumor. I am not certain. Please can you stay? another one centimeter width of the tumor. So this, because the surgeon is still operating while we are doing it, so it is possible for them to send another sleeve of tissue surrounding the tumor. So the pieces of tissue to be studied are snap frozen in a cold environment, and this freezing makes the tissue solid enough to section with a microtome. So this is a microtome, which is, uh, th this is a cryostat. Um, which is actually a refrigerated box containing a microtome. The temperature inside the cry cryostat is about minus 20 to minus 30 degrees Celsius. The tissue sections are cut and picked up on a glass slide, and the sections are then ready for staining. Uh, this, is a, this was a video of a frozen section. Uh, this this can It's not there, okay. So um, the way it's, you can see a little bit of uh, a white thing. This is ice containing the tissue. And um, this is also like a microtome, which advances it uh, a regular distances. And a thin section has been cut here, and which can be taken up by a glass light, stained, while the patient is still getting operated in the uh, theater. Another thing that. <coughs> has a dimension uh, is immunohistochemistry. It is a method for detecting antigens or haptens in cells of a tissue section by exploiting the principle of antibodies binding specifically to antigens in biological tissues. This is mainly used to identify the lineage of cells. So this is a very complex mechanism in which there is a primary antibody, secondary antibody, then there is a polymer, DAP staining, and through this complex antibody, we do a test. This is the, uh, this is the automated IFC uh, walk stations. We have four of them. Um, and the advantages is that there is a greater consistency of staining here. There are fast and accurate results and decreased use of reagents with less use of manpower. Um, this was also a video. Let me see. I don't, I've actually deleted most of the videos because it was taking up too much space. So we got one of the microtome videos uh, uh, walking. So this is a fully automated microtome. As you can see, uh, this this black thing is uh, is go going on its own, and this is the uh, microtome. Uh, th this is the paraffin block, which is getting advanced at pre-designated distances every time, and a section is being uh, will the, here a section will come out from the, there.
antibodies. These are where the, all the antibodies are. We have around 140 antibodies in our lab, and this is getting scanned and to see if there is adequate concentration of antibodies in this, uh, in the lab, in the, in these containers. And the, here are the polymer, the DABs that enables to uh, check the concentration. And the slides are somewhere here, and they will pick the antibodies from here and drop it on the slide, and thereby enables to uh, um, stain, the, uh, stain the slides. So what are the uses of immunohistochemistry? So when a tumor comes to us, we don't ha we'll have to say whether it's benign and malignant. But even in the malignant, there are carcinoma, there is sarcoma, there is lymphoma, there is um, plasma cytoma. So we have to try to differentiate the neoplasms into all these broad categories. Then we have to prognosticate them. A pathologist's work would also need to prognosticate means suppose if the tumor is ER positive. If a breast tumor is ER positive, the person will get tamoxifen. If the breast tumor is HER2 new positive, then the person will get uh, trastuzumab. If the breast tumor is highly proliferating, if a lymphoma is highly proliferating, it's called diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So we'll treat it with a, a different therapy. So that way we are trying to uh, do a PI 67 by immunohistochemistry to find out exactly how fast the tumor is proliferating. So we have to manually count the cells. So 100 out of 100 cases, out of 100 cells, maybe 60% is proliferating or 80% is proliferating. Then predicting response to treatment. So the patient has had some treatment and we have to figure out how the, the treatment will be. Uh, how the treatment, uh, whether the person will respond to this treatment. So this is done for a lung cancer, lung adenocarcinomas. We have specific targeted therapies. Huh? So if the tumor is ALK positive, then the, uh, the oncologist will give crizotinib. If the tumor is EGFR positive, then they will give a lot of it, gefitinib. So this way, um, the treatments will differ based on what we, the pathologists, say that this is, so therein lies the role of immunohistochemistry. Detection of metastasis. So for a um, specimen of a head and neck, a breast or a colon, we might have to look at 30 to 40 slides before constructing the report that I showed you. So there were 27 out of 34 lymph nodes here. So it is a very tedious task for the pathologist to look at 30 sections to find out that one, two, three, or maybe more metastasis. Huh. So immunohistochemistry and um, um, computational pathology can help us in uh, detection of the metastasis much quicker. Screening of inherited cancer syndrome, so Lynch syndrome in colorectal adenocarcinomas, we do a panel of markers to help us in this diagnosis. So this is a um, tumor which is present in the lymph node very uh, difficult, um, very difficult maybe to figure out on morphology what type of cell this is, but uh, we do a CD20. It is strongly positive. CD20 is an immunohistochemical stain. It is strongly positive, though we can say this is a B cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And as soon as I say that, the pus, the hemato-oncologist will give rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 antibody, and thereby that will help in uh, elevation of this um, res resolution of the t uh, tumor. So this is immunohistochemistry frozen section and um, the routine HNE forms the back, uh, backbone of our disease, uh, of our lab. But suppose for a, this is my routine trace that I have to see through in a particular day to get my work done. So each tray will have, um, show, will have contained 20 slides. So I have to maybe look at um, to 10 trays of this to go through 200 slides to actually finish my day's work. But what is this digital pathology? This is our digital pathology scanner. Um, so what, is, uh, what, uh, what it does is, it is actually a whole slide imaging. So whole slide imaging means it's, it will scan the entire slide. And instead of seeing the glass slide under the microscope, I will see the, 
the pictures of it in the computer. So it is seeking to replicate and ultimately replace the existing glass microscopy. So what are the uses of digital pathology? So as of now, we do not use digital pathology for our routine work, but it can be used. It can be used, suppose you, you can do it from your home, the entire workload, and second opinion, telepathology. So you can send a scanned picture to any expert, whether he's sitting in US or UK, and that person can give us a um, diagnosis or an opinion about the case from there. Participation in external quality assurance schemes. We, are, we as pathologists are strictly governed by quality control measures, and one of them is our own quality, uh, whether we are able to uh, maintain our quality in reporting. So what happens is they send certain slides to us and we have to uh, make the diagnosis and send them back. Huh. So a small, bi a small biopsy is difficult to send to um, 300 centers throughout the, uh, throughout the, throughout the country. So they, they can take a scan, five minutes. They can take a scanned picture and can send it to different. Yeah. Immunostain interpretation and interoperative telepathology can also be done with digital pathology. Uh, <coughs> interoperative is that suppose you don't have a neurosurgeon, in, a neuropathologist in your lab. So you can uh, scan it and can send it to somebody else. He can scan and can say the diagnosis while the patient is waiting in another hospital for the diagnosis. But there are challenges. There are challenges of regulation, validation, implementation, and pathologists as are resistant to change because they are more comfortable with the glass microscope. So this is a, a site which we normally used to use when we were in, uh, when I was in UK. So as you can see, there are. Uh, this is the digital pathology slide. You have slide viewing for the public for external quality teaching and training. And here you can do several EQA schemes by use of this digital pathology platform and that and also helps us in our preparation for exams and for routine uh, workload. Next we come to computational pathology. I'll just touch upon it. My colleague Dr. Paramita will dwell on it. So it is an approach to diagnosis that incorporates multiple sources of data. Uh, example from pathology, radiology, clinical, molecular, and lab operations, and uses mathematical models to generate diagnostic inferences and presents clinically actionable knowledge to customers. It will enable us to streamline workflow in future by screening situations that do not require <coughs> a pathologist review. So the main thing is to identify an, uh, uh, the tissue patterns in HE and quantitative analysis of immunohistochemistry. So because of personalized treatments, our workloads are gradually increasing day by day, and due to a shortage of pathologists, this, is, this has to be the way forward in which we can overcome this uh, uh, workload. So what it does, it can, it, it has, uh, it can enable uh, automated identification of metastasis in breast and colon, Measuring the evidence and extent of invasion, example in prostate, cumulative gra quantitative grading of cancer, example in prostate and breast, and automated measurement of molecular analytics, such as all the prognostic markers that we could do in breast, in colon, and lung prostate. So I'll just give, I'll just sign out giving a small example of what we could be done. So this is a lymph node uh, which. Uh, uh, in which there is only a 2.9 um, millimeter of metastasis. So to find out this, we have to look at 20 sections, uh, 20, 20 lymph nodes to find out this small year. So it's a very tedious and onerous task. So what, what this year can be done is that instead of we uh, scanning the, uh, all the 20 slides, the computer will present to the pathologist triaged regions of interest and we will just okay them saying that this is definitely a metastasis and therefore uh, the, um, the report goes out much quicker that way. But to look at that, the, com the computer has to, identif has to look at the original tumor because this is what we are doing in our brains when we are deciding it's a metastasis. Look at the original tumor, find a metastatic tumor in the lymph node and then find out, compare the primary and metastatic tumor, 
characterize and confirm the measurement of the tumor and count the positive lymph nodes as I showed in the report, 27 out of 34. And also to be aware that certain um, pathologies look like metastasis but is actually not a metastasis. So that might be a tall order for the computers to straight away do it but at least they can present some uh, regions of interest to us and enable us to uh, do the job much quicker. So therein lies the hope for the computation. So the take home is that it's a multi-state labor intensive procedure. It's uh, automation is comparatively less because of the complexity of tissue processing and varied disease biology and this use of digital and computational pathology offers light to reduce the burden of histopathologies. With this, I'd like to thank, this is my team.